and we're live. Ruchka, go ahead. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for attending today and greetings from here. Join us. Uh, th uh, thanks everyone for joining today and uh, everyone is on different timings. So greetings everyone. And uh, today we are gonna be listening to Alessio Bac Bacchino. Uh, he is a postdoctoral fellow at uh, ETS Zurich. He received a PhD at the University of Oslo, investigating computational approaches to improve electrophysiology experiments for high density multi electrode arrays. Alicia's research combines neurotechnology, computational neuroscience, and neural engineering to improve electrological techniques in neuroscience. He's particularly interested in advanced recording and stimulation modalities to probe neural activity in biophysically detailed computational models of neurons and large scale analysis of electrophysiology recordings. Uh, so now uh, Alessio will share his work with you. And uh, Alessio, now it's yours, all yours. Please go ahead and share your screen and uh, we can enjoy your science. All right, there we go. So I guess my screen is shared now. and. like to thank the science um, to organize this seminar series and also Worldwide Neuro for hosting all of these talks and make science more accessible for everyone. And today I will present um, a spike interface, which is a unified framework for spike sorting. And before uh, starting, I actually want to acknowledge all the people that contributed to this um, uh, project, especially Cole Hurwitz and uh, Matthias Enig from the uh, University of Edinburgh, Samuel Garcia from the Center of Research in Neuroscience in Lyon, Jeremy Maglan uh, from the Flatiron Institute, uh, Joshua Siegel from the Allen Institute of Brain Science and uh, Roger Hurwitz. And um, I'm currently at ETH Zurich, as Ruchika said, at the Bioengineering Laboratory. And uh, in this uh, talk, I would mainly start by introducing what, what is spike sorting and why is currently uh, still unsolved problem in neuroscience. And then I will go through an, basically a historic computational workflow of uh, spike sorting techniques and then present what is the most modern uh, approach to solve this issue. And then in the second part, I will focus on uh, spike interface. So spike interface is a, a Python package, open source that we developed to basically be able to encompass the entire uh, pipeline that um, revolves around spike sorting. And also I will spend a bit of time showing how we can use spike interface to compare and benchmark different uh, spike sorting tools. Okay, so as you, uh, as you all know, you probably are in the neuroscience spectrum in some of these uh, uh, basically scales. So we can study the brain at very different scales from the molecular to the cellular and circuit level, or we can look at different regions and also try to come up with uh, some uh, theoretical or even like experimental approaches to try to understand how the brain works as a whole. But if we focus on, um, oops, if we focus on um, the circuits level, then our main friend to probe neural activity is uh, extracellular electrophysiology. So with extracellular electrophysiology, uh, what we do is basically um, inserting uh, electrodes in the brain and they pick up the activity of, um, of neurons that surround these electrodes. And we see this activity as uh, spikes in our signals. And over the last 30 years or actually even more, there's been a lot of development in um, the technology that we can use in order to improve the way and maximize the number of neurons that we re can record at the same time. Many people use uh, tetrodes, which are bundles of microwires or usually four microwires uh, bundled together. And this of course improves the separability of different neurons. Then around the 70s, 80s, um, researchers started to develop uh, silicon probes. So these use a, a silicon substrate with some embedded metal electrodes. 
so they can provide a higher uh, spatial resolution. And in recent year, there's been a huge development and a huge push by the field in um, these high density microelectrode or multi-electrode arrays. And the main difference between these uh, two, uh, let's say, designs on the top and the two at the bottom is that these high density uh, micro microelectrode arrays, in, or in order to achieve such a high spatial resolution, so in this case, you can see the scale, by, scale bar here is 15 micrometers and here as well. So we are really down to the same size of a single neuron is because uh, these kind of probes have uh, embedded electronic circuits and allow basically to record the activity, to uh, amplify it and to digitize it in place, which yields a higher signal to noise ratio and in general, a better signal. So where does this signal come from? If we focus on a single neuron, I guess we all know that they communicate via uh, action potentials. And when a neuron fires an action potential, it, there's basically an exchange or of ions from the inside to the outside of the membrane and also vice versa from the outside to the inside. And these ions, basically we can see them as um, electrical currents. And when an electrical current is generated in a conductive medium, as we can basically represent the brain or the brain tissue as, uh, is going to also generate uh, an extracellular uh, potential that we can record with extracellular electrodes. Now, the actual uh, signals that we record from the single neurons depends on uh, many different factors. So in particular, uh, uh, these signals are influenced by the neural morphology and the distribution of ion channels, or say the biophysics of the cell. And this will shape in a very unique way the signal that we record from each neuron separately. So that we, use, we can refer to basically an extracellular signature of each neuron because all of them will be slightly different because basically the position with respect to the electrodes will be slightly different. Uh, they will um, uh, express different ion channels. So the biophysics also will be uh, different. And when we insert a probe in the brain, depending on the position and the distribution of the neurons around the probe, we will observe several of these uh, signatures that are mixed in the same um, extracellular recording, right? So basically what we are in front of is a blind source separation. So we don't know which neurons we are recording from. We don't know how, ma how many neurons we're recording from, and we, are, we don't know when they're firing an action potential. And usually uh, the way these blind source separation problems are introduced as is a, as a cocktail party where you have people at a party sipping their cocktails and then you have different microphones uh, located uh, uh, in the room. And then you want to try to basically infer what each person is, um, is talking about from these microphones. So we can think of the microphones as our um, extracellular electrodes and we can uh, think of the people as our single neurons that instead are sipping their um, neurotransmitter cocktails of dopamine or glutamate in their uh, synaptic cups, right? And so spike sorting basically is a process of trying to identify the activity of, sing of single neurons from the mixture of extracellular recordings. So let's see now how spike sorting is done. And also I will try to give an historical computational workflow and also what is the latest in terms of uh, spike sorting um, approaches and research. And uh, bear in mind that this is actually a very active field of research. There are many uh, papers that, have been that are published every year trying to improve the way that we, um, we basically perform this very essential step in analyzing these data sets. But the initial idea is the same. We want to start from the extracellular potentials that can be recorded from probes that are inserted in the brain or also from probes in which neurons are cultured upon, for example, in in vitro preparations. And then the spike sorting takes this raw data as input and it spits out a series of um, binary time series each of them refers to basically the spike times of the different neurons that are found in the recordings. 
So as a first step to uh, spike sorting, we want to pre-process the potential. Why? Because when we insert these probes uh, in the brain, we usually observe uh, two different components, a low frequency component, which is referred to as local field potentials. And this is um, uh, generated by the aggregate activity of entire um, populations of neurons, and especially of um, uh, synchronized synaptic inputs to those neurons. But if we want to focus on the spiking activity, then the first step is to perform a high pass filter. So we usually filter the signal and we remove everything below 300 Hertz or sometimes even 500 Hertz. And another uh, possible pre-processing step is performing some sort of um, uh, spatial uh, filtering or whitening. And this is usually done to try to reduce the contribution of um, external noise uh, in the signal. Once we have these pre-processed uh, potentials, the next step is to detect spikes. And spike detection is usually done by uh, thresholding uh, each channel, because we know that these, uh, these neurons basically have a, uh, when, they, when they fire an action potential, we observe these extracellular spikes that usually, or basically if we can detect these uh, spikes, they, it should exceed by a certain extent, the noise level of the different uh, recorded channels. And once we have detected spikes, the next step is to extract the um, uh, waveform. So from each uh, detected point, we extract a snippet of the recording that correspond to a putative uh, spike. And we want to perfectly align those. Then when we have these uh, aligned spikes, we try to reduce the dimensionality of the problem, for example, by applying some uh, principal component analysis or other dimensionality reduction techniques. So these allow us to visualize these um, highly high dim dimensional uh, waveforms in a lower dimensional space. And it also helps with the next step, which is trying uh, with the, the unsupervised methods, so with clustering techniques to figure out how many different clusters there are in these uh, low dimensional projections. And once we have done that, we assume that the different clusters correspond to the different neurons. And so we can say we have basically uh, finished our spike sorting because we assign to each of these point a certain class which corresponds to a certain neuron. So to sum up, uh, the first step is to detect and align the spikes. So we can see here some real data with some uh, aligned uh, waveforms. And we can actually see these waveforms also in this matrix form, right? In the um, each row here represents a different waveform. We can see that basically here, they all have the peaks, but we can see that inside this big matrix, there might be, and we could also actually see it here there might be two different neurons, one with a large amplitude and one with a smaller amplitude. But in order to make the, the next step easier, uh, we perform a dimensionality reduction. So we can see here, we go from uh, more than 20 dimensions to uh, four or five dimensions. And this makes it easier for clustering algorithms to figure out uh, what different groups are in the in the signals and then after clustering we have this orange neuron and this blue neuron that in this case likely correspond to this high amplitude neuron and this lower amplitude uh, one now there is one problem that uh, might actually break this uh, initial framework that i presented and this is the fact that sometimes different neurons can spike at the same time and we can see an example here. In this uh, trace uh, snippet, we have actually two different neurons. Neuron one with a very large negative peak and also a, a positive rebound. And then we have this neuron two with kind of a funky waveform uh, in this example. And we can see that uh, when they spike, uh, when they fire an action potential in isolation, they're clearly visible. But if they happen to spike at the same time, what we observe extracellularly, since the, basically the, the neural tissue is mainly a resistive and purely conductive medium. So what we observe is basically a summation of the two waveforms. And the second neuron is kind of hidden 
here in the positive phase of the first neuron. And this, of course, will kind of break our uh, PCA uh, plus clustering approach because this waveform, it seems similar to uh, uh, neuron one, but slightly different, uh, but it doesn't look at all like neuron two. So we would basically misclassify this spike. And we can see it also here in the uh, PCA space or in some uh, two dimensional um, space. If we have two templates and with template, I mean the average extracellular action potential that belongs to a neuron. In this case, we have the first one, the template one in blue and the second one template two in red. When they spike in isolation, they basically in this two dimensional representation, they occupy two very distinct clusters, but we can see here that there are some points that lie somewhere in between. And this could be due to the fact, or it's likely due to the fact that these spikes represent spatiotemporal collisions. And so we need to, researchers have actually tried uh, to find a way to deal with this. And the way to, that's normally uh, done is by adding an extra step, which is called template matching. So uh, the main idea is that after we have uh, identified our putative neurons, so the initial work, workflow is basically the same, but after what we can do is basically extract the centroid of these clusters and go back to the original space. So we basically extract the average waveform uh, of each uh, neuron that is found. And then we try to fit it, to fit each of the extracted neurons to the original data with the hope that we can actually this way, we can resolve uh, also overlapping spikes. And uh, most of the recently developed uh, spike sorting algorithms, including spiking circus, kilo sort, YAS, his initial binary pursuit algorithm and the Tri de Clou by Samuel Garcia, who is one of the main contributor also to the spike interface. They do implement this extra template matching uh, technique, which basically improves the overall uh, performance of spike sorting if done properly. And it works like this. So. Uh, let, let's see an example. So we start again with our raw data and then we have identified a set of neurons and a set of relative templates that we want to fit back uh, to the original data. So what we would do then is basically to uh, start with one neuron, we detect a spike and then we subtract it from the recording. Then there's another spike from another neuron, we subtract it. Third spike, we can see now it's more visible and it makes it easier to find these overlapping spikes because as we find spikes in our original signal, the, uh, the spike is subtracted. And so other spikes that basically would be hidden in spike collision this way would basically become apparent. So this provides a better way to handle uh, with the spike collisions. And this is what we refer to as the modern approach to spike sorting. Okay. So after this um, broad introduction to uh, spike sorting and what are the common approaches in the field, I'd like to move on and present the actual, our, our contribution, which is a spike interface. So why did we start uh, with this project? If we look around in the field, as I said before, it's actually very lively and there are many tools developed uh, uh, every year and it's kind of hard to um, orient yourself if you're starting analyzing your data uh, or basically if you move to a new lab spike sorting is kind of done differently in different labs and it, this is mainly because there are so many tools around there and it's kind of a jungle of spike sorting tools we have the kilo sort family iron class Three de Clou, HD sort, the JR class, which is kind of the parent of Iron class, Wave class, Cluster. But there's many of them, so many that basically uh, the Paninsky lab that developed uh, Yas, <laughs> they were out of names, and so they called it yet another spike sorter. And this actually is a problem for uh, neuroscience research because it makes it hard to choose your spike sorter to understand which spike sorter is best suited for some kind of data. And this mainly due for some unaddressed limitations in the field. 
So the first limitation is actually in the fact that there's many different acquisition systems around and all of them come with different um, uh, file formats and that usually requires um, uh, labs to build um, customized code in order to load the data and then run a specific spike sorter and this is because also spike sorters require a cert certain spike formats certain sorry five formats in order to be run and the second uh, difficulty that um, basically in order to compare and pro properly benchmark the different available spike sorters is that there's a large variety of them and they could actually differ also in the underlying programming language. Some are MATLAB based, some are Python based or C, C++ and also other um, uh, languages are used. So it's it's hard to unify all of them into a, a un, like unified framework. Each of the spec sorter come with their own set of uh, configuration files, parameters. Many of them have a different way to describe both the data and the metadata associated with the recording, like what is the probe configuration and so on. And this makes it um, complicated to make a rigorous benchmarking of the algorithms and actually there are base or there used to be no rigorous benchmarking i will show later that this now is getting better but when we started this project back in 2018 uh, each spec sorting paper reported um, comparisons with another subset of tools, maybe cherry picked. Uh, and so they basically showed that they performed better than others and other spec sorter better than yet other ones. So it was kind of hard to make sense of all this um, uh, information. And then the, the third problem is that, that I also touched upon before is that since we have um, different file formats and different sorters this usually requires um, a lot of custom codes to be developed and this makes it complicated to um, perfectly track the provenance of the results and this could hinder also the reproducibility of the analysis and so with spike interface we try to address um, these problems so what is spike interface spike interface is basically a python package and in short it allows in a very easy uh, way to run multiple uh, spike sorters on the same data sets. So that basically you could try different algorithms and see which one works uh, best for your data or for your uh, experiments. And then we also have uh, a lot of other functionalities related to spike sorting, uh, like uh, pre and post processing. We have ways to validate or to do some quality control of the spec sorting output, also to perform um, uh, curation of your output. We have tools that allow you uh, or researchers to compare and benchmark the different spec sorters. We provide um, uh, widgets for data visualization, so you can see what um, uh, the spec sorting pipeline is uh, outputting at different steps. And we try with this unified framework to make um, analysis, uh, processing of elect extracellular electrophysiology data as reproducible as possible. So we have recording formats, spike sorters, and interface with spike sorted formats. And on top of this, we provide analysis and visualization tools. So as I said before, bef before spike interface um, came into uh, uh, basically into the field, the usual way to approach this was very lab specific. A certain lab might use a certain acquisition system or a couple of them or three of them. And this uh, step of converting the raw data to a file format that a spike sorter accepts requires some custom code, right? And the same on the output side, the spike sorter usually outputs some um, spike sorter specific file formats. And so it requires, again, uh, each lab to build a separate pipeline to basically go from the raw data to the sorter data. With spike interface, our intuition was the following. Instead of going with this customized code, we can provide a standardized interface to the file formats. 
And we have two different kinds of interfaces. We have a recording extractor that interfaces with the actual uh, raw data, so with the extracellular recordings. And then since these um, extractors are standardized, then we can actually wrap different spike sorters knowing that they, they need to basically interface uh, with a certain um, um, with a certain data abstraction layer that we develop. And the same holds for the sorting extractor. So the spike sorter will still output is sorting specific file format, but using a sorting extractor that interfaces with the sorted data, we can um, interface with this data in a standardized way. Oops. And this basically allow us to um, very easily once we have uh, extracted our raw data, not to only run one spike sorter that would require specific code to interface uh, with the spike sorting specific requirements, but internally we do, knowing these standardized interfaces, we provide the code under the hood to interface with the different spike sorters. So we could actually run three different spike sorting algorithms with literally three lines of code. And then we get um, a sorting extractor object as an output, and we can interact with this object in the same way. We don't basically, we can forget about the underlying uh, file format. On top of this, since we have this standardized interface, this makes it very uh, easy to build um, pipelines which are based on, on this um, interface. We could, for example, before running our main spike sorting job, we could run uh, several pre-processing steps. For example, we could apply our filtering. We could try to remove noise or remove some artifacts or rather uh, remove some channels that were too noisy during the experiment. And similarly, after we run the spike sorting algorithm, we can apply some post-processing. For example, we could apply some uh, uh, automatic uh, curation, for example, to remove units that are too small in amplitudes or that have too few spikes. And finally, when we are happy, we have an object that we know how to interface with and we can basically save it to whatever format we want and proceed with our analysis. Um, we have a whole um, set of supported technologies both on the recording side, we interface with over 15 different um, either uh, uh, formats that come from acquisition systems or also formats that come from uh, simulators, as, we see, as we'll see something later, or we interface with the neurodata without borders that provides this standardized file format for neuroscience. Currently, we support over 10 different spike sorters that again can be run with a single line of code. And then we also support several um, um, spike sorting extractor uh, wrappers. So we support loading data on all the spike sorting uh, specific outputs uh, plus others, for example, some uh, um, acquisition systems like uh, Neuralinks or Plexon they also save some um, uh, spiking information online and we could also load these and maybe compare it with the output of some um, uh, automatic spike sorters. So let's see now a concrete example. So let's assume you have, uh, you're using the OpenIFIS um, uh, acquisition system. So you're acquire, you acquire your data and you have your OpenIFIS folder. And then what you want to do in spike interface is to load the recording then we want to load some probe information. For example, let's assume we use um, uh, some tetrads. Um, so we need to basically give the spike sorter the information that we have several uh, channel groups that we might want to spike sort separately. Then we can apply some bandpass filter and a common median reference to remove uh, uh, external noise or at least reduce it. And then finally, we want to run our spec sorting algorithm like a mountain sort for, and then we want to remove uh, small clusters. Like we want to remove units with less than a hundred spikes. And then as a last step, uh, we can also export to Phi. And Phi is another very widely used uh, open source um, uh, package 
that basically allow you to visualize a spike sorting output and also perform some um, visual inspection and the manual curation of the spike sorting output, which is still uh, very important. And so the nice thing in spec interface is that these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps uh, pipeline literally translates to seven lines of Python code. So we would first load or interface with our uh, open EPIS folder with the open EPIS recording extractor. We would then load a probe file that provides the information about the geometry or the channel groups of the um, recording of, of the different uh, electrodes. And then we want to run our bandpass filter. So we use our pre-processing module of the spike toolkit uh, package. And then we run our common reference. And then finally, we run our spike sorting job. And this is where actually the computation is done. All the other steps are performed in a lazy way. So you can build your pipelines, but no actual computation is done until you actually ask for the process traces. And in this case, this is done at the spec sorting level. And finally, from the sorting output that we call here sorting MS4, we can perform some automatic curation like threshold on the number of spike. And we want to remove the basically clusters with less than 100 spikes. And once we are happy with our curation, we can export to Phi just by combining our original recording. In this case, it's this common referenced uh, recording with our curated sorting output. And it will save um, basically everything you need to run Phi in the provided output folder. OK, so after um, basically showing you how easy it is to run these um, uh, different spec sorters. So again, I just want to stress that here, instead of run mountain sort for you could have run KiloSort 2, KiloSort 3, Spike in Circus, YAS, 3D Clue, any Spike sorter that is supported uh, by Spike interface. And we're also like constantly updating the um, Spike sorting tools that we support also with a lot of uh, contribution from the actual uh, Spike sorting developers. But uh, given that we have now a standardized and unified framework for Spike sorting, we can actually start asking our initial question, can we benchmark different spec sorting tools and how can we do it? So first of all, we need a way to um, compare the output of different spec sorters. And the way this is done in the spec interface, it's actually twofold. So we can either compare the output of a certain spec sorter to a ground truth data set. So a ground truth data set is a data set, and I have a couple of slides later explaining some examples in which we know the underlying uh, activity of the, um, of the units that are in the recording. So we have a way to know what are the, what is the ground truth spiking information. And in this case, what the spike sorting comparison does is it, to compute an agreement score so basically how many spikes are happening at the same time between the ground truth uh, spike trains and the spike sorted spike trains. And then we perform a best match assignment. So we try to say, okay, then this ground truth unit corresponds to this sorted unit. And after we have done that, we can actually look at the numbers and compute different performance metrics such as accuracy, precision, and recall. And we can also classify whether a ground truth unit was collect correctly identified, so it was a true posit positive, or if it was not in the original uh, ground truth data set, so it was a false positive. And we can also go even further and say, okay, this unit is a redundant unit, so it's been identified twice uh, by the spike sorter, or it's an over-merged unit. And this means basically like in this case, we see that um, the spike train number four on the tested uh, spike sorting output. So this is the spike sorting output actually corresponds not to one, but to three different, partially to three different ground truth units. And so this would be an overmerged unit. Uh, on top of this ground truth analysis, we can also compare directly. Maybe we don't have this ground truth information, but we can compare uh, the agreement between different spike sorters. And in order to do that, we basically apply uh, the same approach, 
So we compute the agreement score, but between each spike sorting pair. So imagine we have three different sorters. We compute the agreement score between, between uh, among each spike train of each pair of sorters. And once we have the agreement between all the units from all sorters, we can compute um, a graph. And then we can um, use graph-based analysis to interrogate uh, this graph and ask which units are in agreement with one, two, or three sorters, which units are not in agreement at all, and so on. So a couple of extra, no, I have a couple of extra <laughs> words on the ground truth data sets later. So uh, these, I will start presenting some results that was in uh, that were presented in our eLife paper. So we started with this uh, multi-sorter comparison. So we took an uh, open data set from the Allen Brain Observatory, the uh, NeuroPixels data set, 15 minutes long with uh, 246 active channels. And we can see here, an activity map of the probe. So yellow means higher spikes per second and blue means lower. And these, just, these, are, these are just some um, uh, sample traces. So we can see there's quite some uh, spiking activity. And then we just ran six different spike sorters and herding spikes, kilosort 2, three d clue, spike in circus and HD sort. And the first striking result that we saw is that there is a lot of disagreement. So there were in total over, let's say 1,400 slash 500 units found, and only 33 of these units were in agreement with all six sorters. We can see this result here is combined from all sorters, and we can also look at the, the different sorters separately. The color here means how many sorters uh, agreed on this unit, so the, the redder, it gets, I don't know if red there is a word, but then the more red it gets, the more uh, sorters agreed on these uh, units. And we can see that there are many units in all sorters, basically, that are only found by a single sorter. And so then we turn to uh, ground truth data sets to try to investigate a little bit more in detail this phenomenon. And there are two different kinds of uh, ground truth data sets that we could have used. So the first one, comes from paired recordings. And they could be done in vitro, which is a bit easier, but there are also some uh, in vivo data set. And basically the idea is that you have your cells on a, a multi-electro array or an extracellular probe, and then you use a second um, acquisition system that could be, uh, usually it's a patch by pet to uh, patch or perform a juxtacellular. So basically just touching the membrane of the cell of one specific cell. And this would give you a ground truth spikes that we can then try to match to the spikes detected from, uh, by spike sorters from the extracellular channels. The main problem of this approach, while this is very good because it's basically, it uses real experimental data, is that we only have one cell at a time. So imagine if we wanted to benchmark uh, many spike sorters and we need a data set with hundreds of cells, we would need to perform hundreds of experiments. And these also are very hard experiments to perform. If any of you is a patcher, you would know. It takes time. A second solution would be to use uh, fully simulated in silico um, recordings. And um, an example, a simulator that I developed is called the uh, uh, MEAREC. And basically it combines biophysically detailed simulations of um, uh, single neurons using neuron and a package called LFPi to compute the extracellular action potentials. And then it, it can generate several recordings from these um, computed templates by combining them with the randomly generated spike trains. And we can also generate different um, complicated behavior that uh, for spike sorting like bursting and drifting, we have different noise levels uh, and so on. And uh, this simulation environment actually it gives us full control on the recording so we could think about this as a test bench to um, improve our spike sorting method so we can simulate uh, signals on different probes with different number of neurons with uh, we can control the number of spike collisions that i talked about before and so on and this is exactly um, what we did but before uh, before that 
Uh, I just want to spend uh, one minute also explaining what these plots that I showed before um, display. So basically, these are called agreement matrix. So after we compute the agreement scores, so basically the number of spikes between two different spike trains that actually correspond to each other, we can um, perform a best assignment between the ground truth um, units and the tested unit. So the tested unit would be the output of a spike sorter. And this actually allows not only to benchmark the performance of, sp of the spike sorter, but it also allows us to find uh, strengths and weaknesses in a spike sorter. For example, in this case, we can see that the, the accuracy was very high from all units and there are no out of diagonal uh, values, which would be uh, misclassified spikes. In this second case in the middle, for example, we can see that while all of the, there is a very strong diagonal above like 90%, some of the units have duplicates, right? And so these allow us to say, hey, this spike sorting tool is working greatly, but we have to improve this on this aspect. While in this case, it's something in between, it works well for a few ground truth units, and then it misses some completely, and then it, there is this blob of misclassified spikes. So we simulated, going back to the results, we simulated a 10 minutes uh, NeuroPixels recording using the MEAREC simulator. And in this case, we knew we had 250 units firing action potentials in the recordings. So if we have this information, we can compute for each unit, the accuracy, the precision, and the recall, and we can start properly ben benchmarking spike sorting um, uh, available spike sorting tools. So in this case, we can see that KiloSort 2 actually does very well in uh, accuracy, precision, and recall. So you can see this cloud on the top, while others are kind of have mixed results. So it's not a trivial um, uh, job to spike sort even these simulated data. But um, KiloSort high performance actually comes at the cost of finding many units. In this case, these blue bars represent the number of false positive units. So units that are in the spike sorting output, but they're not in the ground truth um, uh, in the ground truth data set. So KiloSort finds over 200 well detected units at the cost of finding many false positives as well and some redundant units. And so we need to combine all this information. For example, uh, 3 the clue here finds uh, just over maybe 120 good units, but only very few false positives. So uh, in this case, 3 the clue would require little curation, but it would miss many uh, good units, while KiloSort would probably require some extensive manual curation, but you have all the information there. And then we performed the same uh, analysis that we did before. So we analyzed the comparison between the different sorters. And we saw that also in this case, there are plenty of units which are yellow here. So they've been only detected by uh, one sorter. But then since now we have simulated data, we can go further and ask, okay, do these uh, units that have been detected by a single sorter actually correspond to real units or are they only noise? And we can see in this bottom bar plot here, we're plotting the number of units on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the number of sorters that agree on, the, um, on that unit. And it's, this is split by sorter. And in blue are the matched units. So the ones that are actually in the ground truth data set, while in red is the false positives unit. And we can see that almost 100% of the units which haven't been matched or haven't been found one by more than one sorter are false positives. So it seems that basically the way that each spike sorter finds bad units, it's kind of unique. So we try to actually go even further and say, okay, can we then combine the output of multiple sorters to improve the performance? And uh, we tried to do that. So we uh, combined the output of the different, six different spike sorters and we kept a unit only if it was in agreement with at least two spike sorters. And these are called consensus unit. And we basically, um, we, refer to as the, to, we refer to this method as uh, ensemble spike sorting strategy. And in order to ask whether this actually works on real data, we went back to the original uh, NeuroPixels data, and now we asked two different uh, experts 
to manually curate the data set. And we can see this here. So basically, we started from the output of Kilosor 2. And we can see that um, the two experts found uh, over, let's say, 230 units. Uh, they agreed on 230 good units. There were some differences between the two experts, but over 174 uh, units were rejected by both uh, curators in this case. And then this is basically the performance of the, or the agreement of the um, row output from a spike sorter with this intersection between the two, actually not with the intersection, but with the output of the curated data set. So the, this, the red line, the red color and the blue color uh, refers to the different uh, curators in this case. And we can see that just looking at the output, there's always less than, uh, I would say, 60% agreement between the row spike sorting output and the output after curation. So curation is actually essential in this case. But then we perform the same analysis, only looking at the consensus units. So the units in agreement with at least two sorters. And we found that in most of the cases, now we have over 80% of agreement between um, this consensus or this, the output of the ensemble sorting and the output of the uh, curated data sets, right? So we kind of uh, introduced this uh, possibility of using the strengths uh, of the different spike sorters combined together to basically, um, instead of uh, doing manual curation on the data sets, which is a very uh, time consuming operation and highly subjective. So this could be uh, a standardized and reproducible way to curate the spike sorting output without the involvement of um, humans and researchers. Um, so I also want to mention that on top of this uh, comparison and running different spike sorting capabilities, there are others, uh, other features in spike interface. And one very important one is this uh, quality metrics. So we provide a whole set of different um, quality metrics that can be computed on the spike sorting output. And these would help uh, basically to perform, to assess the performance of a spike sorter when you don't have a ground truth information, which is basically every time you perform an experiment. But this could be used, for example, also to automatically curate a spike sorting output. And then spike interface has several, uh, as I mentioned above, uh, visualization widgets to visualize spike trains, waveforms, uh, and many other things like to plot spectra of the recordings, uh, to plot different uh, um, the amplitudes or the interspike interval distribution and so on. And then also we have several um, tools to allow to manipulate the recordings before spike sorting. And this, for example, would allow you to, to split your recording in different sub recordings or even to concatenate recordings. So imagine you have your experiment and you um, acquire three different recording sessions, one baseline, then one with an intervention and then one after the intervention to see how the uh, system recovers. And since basically you expect the same units to be present, you can first concatenate the recordings, then run the spike sorting. So you don't have to match back the output of the different uh, uh, spike sorting on the different sessions. And this is done basically automatically. Okay. Then I just want to mention um, before um, finishing my presentation, a couple of uh, twin projects uh, to spike interface. So this is called probe interface. Of course, <laughs> it's uh, the same people that uh, developed it, mainly Samuel Garcia. And the idea is that, um, well, so the, when we get our um, extra server recordings, we need to, a way to describe how we got there, right? And this is done using different probes that have different uh, designs, different channel IDs. They can be connected to different uh, head stages, different connectors. And so it makes it very complicated and tedious to go back and understand which uh, in your recordings, what actually electrode each uh, recorded channel corresponds to. And so with probe interface, we actually try to standardize the description of the probes also with all its metadata, such as what is the shape and size of the electrodes, what is the impedance and so on. And also we try to uh, automate this uh, mapping procedure 
especially for some common pathways that are uh, used. For example, these uh, would be a NeuroNexus or a Cambridge Neurotech probe connect to an intern chip and connected to an uh, intern recording system or an open if system. Uh, if we know that this is a standard way of doing things, we can automatically provide the final mapping and know exactly uh, what, is, what is the electrode ID and also what is the device ID. So in this case, for example, this electrode would be electrode 27 in the probe map, but it would be um, basically channel number nine in the actual, actual recordings or the signals that uh, are uh, acquired by the acquisition system. And finally, a second and very uh, important twin project is a Spike Forest. So Spike Forest is, uh, it uses Spike interface in the background. And the goal of Spike Forest was to, to gather um, a, basically a very large database of um, available ground truth uh, recordings. They can be either paired recordings or synthetic data or even one manually curated recording. And then Spike Forest basically runs all the available uh, Spike sorters and uh, it, um, it reports the performance of different Spike sorters on different data sets. And you can actually, it's an interactive website. You can go here on Spike Forest. Uh, it's mainly developed by the Flatiron Institute and Jeremy Magland. And uh, you can basically explore these and the idea is that um, um, you would be able to find which Spike sorter performs better in a certain data set that you acquired, or even like this is really also pushing spec sorting developers to improve their methods in order to basically achieve a higher uh, performance on this um, common benchmark. And with this, I would actually like to, to thank all the uh, collaborators of these projects, especially uh, Cole Hurwitz and uh, Samuel Garcia, Jeremy McLean from the Flatiron Institute, uh, Josh Siegel from the Allen Institute of Brain Science and uh, Matthias Henning. So this has been a long journey. We started in 2018 and we spent really a lot of time uh, uh, developing this. And we are still always improving and refactoring and adding new features. And everyone is welcome to contribute. This is a list of uh, contributor. I don't think it's uh, completely up to date, but you can find the updated one on the GitHub page. But if you find any problems with the code, any issue, or if you want some new features, feel free to contribute to open an issue or to make a pull request and we'll be happy to, to discuss. And finally, I would like to thank you all for the attention and wish you fun <laughs> spec sorting your data. Thanks. And, uh, thanks, Ali. Uh, Lucica, I cannot hear you anymore. So the sound kind of went out. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, thank you, Alessio. I just I was just saying that thank you for such a wonderful talk and thanks everyone for attending the talk and uh, appreciating the nature of the talk and raising these questions. And now I'm gonna probably talk uh, probably. Um, transfer these questions to Alessio and ask those questions and uh, he can answer those. Uh, so the first question is from Santiago Bori and uh, he's asking about uh, uh, PCA. So some algorithm have used wavelet transform instead of PCA to uncover spike feature. So do you know if this could help with the cluster separation? Yeah, this is a long-standing question and uh, it might. The, question, the, the answer is it might. So it really depends on uh, the geometry of your probe, how many channels you have, uh, how many spikes you have, uh, how different the spikes are between each other. So there are different dimensionality reduction techniques. And I would say that it would be a bit um, uh, limited to just discuss about dimensionality reduction without discussing about clustering, because of course these two go hand in hand. But one thing that uh, I think Spike Interface could help with, and actually this is also the direction we're going to, is to try to take pieces of different Spike sorters and implement it at se as separate modules in Spike Interface. So basically the idea could be that with this modularization, we could build 
like for example, a spike sorter with the detection and clustering of spike in circuits, with the template matching of kilo sort and with the post-processing of uh, 3D clue or YAS, which might result in actually a better overall performance. And of course, uh, dimensionality reduction and the clustering would be one of these very essential modules. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for answering that question. So the next question is, how do you address the reproducibility problem and marking when yeah. so much of spike sorting is manual work? So, and most tools are not fully automated. Yeah, that's uh, that's basically also why we we started this uh, uh, this project, right? There's little benchmarking, and uh, we are trying to go into the fully out full automation of spec sorting, even because with uh, these newly developed probes where you have hundreds or thousands of, of channels and the same number of units, it would be just impossible to spend hours and hours. Uh, manually curating them. So we are trying two different uh, approaches, but one that I think is very uh, kind of uh, promising is to uh, investigate uh, how the, these quality metrics that I presented actually uh, allow to differentiate whether there are uh, spike sorting errors or whether two units should be merged or split and so on. But I think that in order to do that, we need to combine um, a rigorous benchmarking and also using simulated data sets which try to basically be as close as possible to real uh, experimental data but yeah of course this is a clear open issue in the spec sorting community and we aren't there yet Okay, so next question is, uh, do you think that adopting an open standard such as neuro data without borders will help resolve the issue with different file formats? Um, yes. That's from CC. That's okay, CC. I would say yes, but not on the acquisition side, right? Because when you acquire your data, I mean, some uh, acquisition systems like OpenIFIS, for example, it does allow to save directly to NWB, but many other formats don't, right? And I think that the main improvement that uh, Neurodata Without Borders is bringing to the field is when, it, when you have like done your pre-processing, when you have done your spike sorting, then you save to NWB. So then you can have basically a common way to share your data set and the people your, the, or the entire community know how to actually uh, access this data set and perform uh, more, more analysis or run a different spec sorter or improve on the manual curation and so on. So in short, I think that on the acquisition format, this is not necessary. And this is something that it's already solved in spec interface. We interface so many file formats. So probably the one you find you use is there, or if it's not, we, we are very open to include new formats. And we also use uh, a Neo, which is this other electrophysiology package that interfaces in a standard way to different file formats. So these two projects are highly interconnected. So I don't think it's a problem anymore, but I really like the idea of having a standardized format as output to share with the community. Uh, and how automated is the entire process? Are there any manual steps, for example, in making sure that clustering correctly or the remove units is less than 100 spike or step or something like that. Yeah. So this is highly dependent on what you want uh, from your spike sorting. For example, there are several uh, quality metrics that uh, are very good at classifying some bad units. For example, you could look at the ISI violation threshold uh, ratio. So this tells you how much, uh, let's say, um, how many spikes violate the refractory period. And usually noisy units do violate the refractory period many times because they're not actual neurons. So there are kind of a few of these automatic curations that uh, you could do. And it really depends on what you're trying to do. For example, if you're just trying to, uh, let's say, um, to study the overall response of several brain regions uh, to a different uh, stimula, stimulus or with some decision making. And you know that your, let's say, automatic curation might throw away some units, but you get, let's say, 75% good units and maybe a 5% of bad units. This might, might not alter your results, right? 
But of course, if you're trying, for example, to study the exact timing of place cells related in a like uh, navigation task related to certain um, external cues or something like that, and you want to be sure that you are actually having uh, like all the spikes available, then you need to spend time manually curating uh, your data. So I, I think it really depends on what you're trying to do with your um, uh, experimental data. Uh, so another question is from Srinivas. Uh, he's asking, did you also benchmark test fast uh, from yeah. all the Z lab? Uh, not yet, but we would be happy. Actually, if you uh, if you use it or if you are a developer, we would be happy to actually ask the people that um, contribute these spike sorting tools to also provide a wrapper to spike interface, which is quite easy to to write. And this would make it readily available, in our opinion, to a wider community, and also to these large scale benchmark um, platforms that we are uh, developing. So if you know uh, Srinivas, if you know the developers, or if you are one of the developers, please get in touch and we will be happy to, uh, to include it. Uh, so uh, another question is from, again, from Santiago Bari and uh, he's asking, he, he's asking if this ME rec is publicly available uh, because he has recordings in his lab which seem to be large number of collisions due to highly synchronized activity. Yeah, so it, it is, of course, uh, publicly available on PyPy and also on GitHub. I will share here on the chat. Maybe you can share uh, the GitHub. Can you also paste uh, this on uh, YouTube? Um, yeah, and feel free to get in touch. I have like uh, developed some um, basically specific mechanisms that allow you to uh, control spike collisions of uh, spatially overlapping templates and we're also working on actually benchmarking this so more to come hopefully in a few months and he's also asking if you tried simulations using me me rec with different channel densities and geometries and if so then how much does this channel density matter for spike sorting performance yeah as a matter of fact we are and it's also working. And that's the nice thing about this overall uh, framework that we have simulations and a way to benchmark the algorithm. So we can really uh, investigate and explore different aspects of uh, extracellular recordings and see how different things affect uh, the overall pipeline. And so we are trying to basically run simulations in which we then subsample. We start with a very high density and then we subsample and subsample and subsample. And basically, the idea is to try to um, yeah, understand what would be a right density in order to not to miss units and in order to get as many as we can. But again, it's a work in progress. <laughs> so we don't have uh, final results yet, not even preliminary. <laughs> we started a few months ago. And the next log question is from Lian Clever, and who is appreciating your talk. and. Uh, He's saying that uh, when you talked about growth in silicon simulations, you say that you simulate bursting and drop. obviously in behavioral experiment across different brain states, there's many more variety in spiking patterns than can break the sorter. So some sorters work better in sleep, some during head fix, etc. So how would you benchmark a recording that has all three different components in it? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, again, I think uh, the first part would be just benchmarking separately what the different, these different, let's say, complexities of the extracellular recordings, uh, how they influence spike sorting performance. And then in case you had, um, let's say, an, an extra recording with different states, you could also try to split it into different um, sessions, spike sort it separately and see how many neurons uh, you get, but this is hard to do again without ground truth information. So, or at least you could do it by manually curating and then trying to match the units that are found in different um, states. Uh, but I think, I mean, we still haven't benchmarked completely uh, how the um, difference by sorters break uh, with respect to different uh, complexities of the extracellular signal. So I think that's a very essential and required first step 
to do and to understand to improve existing spike sorting tools. So the last two uh, question is from Gonzalo Oribari from YT. He's also appreciating your talk and he is asking, do you think then that the ensemble sorting algorithm can be improved by also adding many copies of the same sorting algorithm with different conditions? Actually, it could. I know some people are trying to do that, like the, the YAS team is actually trying to basically run uh, several instances of the same algorithm with like different, let's say, uh, random seeds or different configurations and then taking the overall uh, accuracy, overall basically the agreement between these different um, runs. We haven't tried uh, to do this, uh, let's say, properly, so to benchmark it uh, on different data sets, but I think it might help. So maybe like uh, noise, noisy or bad units are only found, uh, or the, the, the way like a, a certain spike sorter, provided that there is some randomness, right? Some spike sorters are fully deterministic. So if you run it 10 times, you will get 10 times the same output. But for the ones that basically do have some internal uh, randomness or some seeds that you can set or some different parameters, then it might be a good idea to try, but uh, we haven't yet. Um, so yeah, Alessio, thanks. Thanks for your great talk and answering all these questions. And I would also like to thank everyone who joined us today. And we appreciate your questions and we appreciate that you enjoyed this talk. And we also invite you for the next talk next Friday, which is, uh, which is on new tools uh, for monitoring and manipulating cellular functions by Dr. Lauren Luber. So and watch and we are waiting for you next week. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah, so that's